Most young people think this is what basketball is all about. But putting the ball through the hoop with the flare of a slam dunk is only a small part of a much bigger picture. First, the player has to get it there. And getting it there, especially in the NBA, means knowing the fundamentals of basketball. These guys, among them some of the most talented basketball players in the world, have come to the big man camp. Meet Pete Newell. It's his camp, and there's no other quite like it in the world. For a solid week, one of the masters of the game will keep these players wrapped up in working on fundamentals. Fellas, uh, welcome for the 15th year. Now for the new fellows here, what we really do is just work on, on the basic fundamentals of footwork, understanding the game a little more, screening, creating more of an of a individual offensive game. Pete is a rare individual. What other coach in any sport can attract this many players of this caliber to a camp during the off season? That we know of, there are none. Although Pete Newell is hardly a household name, you can bet that every front office in the NBA knows who he is. Pete commands tremendous respect for the credentials he developed as a college coach and for his knowledge of the game. Among those who value him as a teacher are not only current players, but also some NBA Hall of Famers and future Hall of Famers. Uh, I should be disqualified for saying because Pete Newell and I are great friends, but I think he is one person in basketball who seems to have universal respect. And I'm not talking about, uh, just about uh, from a professional level. I think Pete has always been an excellent teacher of the game. Uh, I've watched him when I was in college when he was coaching Cal, and uh, I've gotten to know Pete over the years, and uh, he's someone that I always look forward to talking to because I always feel like I can pick up something from him. Uh, he relates well to people from uh, all ages, all backgrounds, and, uh, and, he, and it's fun for him. You know, he still loves the game so much that it's easy to teach, and he, he does an excellent job with it. You have a lot of young players here, uh, players that are, are rookies, uh, uh, second-year players, and he uh, relates well, communicate well with young players. You know, he was an excellent coach in college, and he's always had a good relationship with young players. I owe a, uh, a lot of the success I've had in the NBA to, to Coach Newell. He's, he's really helped me, uh, besides the moves, develop a lot of confidence that I can do things. Um, a lot of players come in and they don't know what they can do, what they can't do. And this camp uh, affords them the opportunity to find out exactly what they can do in the NBA. And besides that, you know, just about every move I'll use in the games comes directly from this camp. Uh, you know, I didn't have a great variety of moves when I started the camp, but now, uh, you know, I just do the moves very simple, keep, keep my game very simple, and, and uh, you know, I figure why not they work. The popularity of this camp has clearly grown over 15 years. By now, the alumni roster looks like a who's who of NBA forwards and centers. But in 1976, the big man camp began with one teacher, and one student. I definitely would have been out of the league in, in five years if it wasn't for Pete. And after working with Pete, I was a starter in, in the NBA for the rest of my career, basically. And um, it's because of his work working with me that it made me successful. I had read where Pete Newell had been a good coach, and he was retiring as a general manager, so I decided to ask him if he could come out and help me. Because I was like a ship or a boat in the water. I was rowing hard but I didn't know where land was. So I needed somebody to show me the right direction, go in the right direction, basically, to become more successful. Nowadays, they have um, about 15 guys. We had maybe one or two, sometimes three. So we never got any rest at the time, so they get rest now. And, and you thought you were going to die every single day. It was very, very difficult. Probably like the Baton Death March. We started many years ago, I guess 15 years ago. 
with uh, Kermit. So we came right here, believe it or not, the gymnasium next to Loyola here, and we'd get there at 7.30. Sometimes we'd climb in a window. Sometimes there was a door open. And, uh, and then Kiki Vanderway, he came out. And so and I had the two of them. It was a, a lot more strenuous workout. Um, you know, we'd go one-on-one -on -one a lot and uh, get really beat up. I was kind of a skinny kid at the time, and, and uh, Kermit used to beat me up pretty good every day, but it was probably the best thing that ever happened to me. It's good on that. At its best, basketball is a skillful blend of spontaneity and discipline. It is also a sort of chess game, a game of move and counter move. The strategy for offensive basketball Pete Newell teaches could be called, in a phrase, read and react. Here at camp, the players learn the tactics to make that strategy effective. Too many players make up their mind what they're going to do before they get the ball. The, f the first thing I tell you is you look at the basket, and at that time you can see everything you need to see. Now what I want you now to see is I want you to see where the defensive man is and use the right move. Now get out here, Armin. Say Armin's defense on me. Now I come out in here, you're over here, Armin. I read, he's playing me baseline, I come here. I just don't want to come out here and, and, and uh, say you're over there. I'm going to go baseline, bang, I got a charge foul. Uh, I, I get the ball, you would see you're loose on me, Armin. I come here, I recognize that I've got the shot. Looking again, always at, at that basket, I recognize, I shoot. If he's over here, I recognize that. Now he comes up on me here. Now I use my reverse. Everything's a counter. Don't forget what I tell you. Whatever that defensive man does, you should have a counter. So I want, to, I want you to read and react now and give the counter this right. Good, 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 18. A good turn. The instruction begins by breaking the game down into its simplest components. As the week wears on, the drills and the situations will become more complex. But Pete starts by teaching the players techniques for getting free to catch the ball where they want to catch it. It's part of a much larger concept called spacing. In the NBA, that coach of the other team is gonna tell his guy, don't let me get out there to the spacing because he knows if he forces me out in here, he's gonna make the passes longer. He's gonna distort the offense. Spacing is so important in offense. So I know that. So I just can't give him a, a shake like this and, and come on, I'm not gonna get the ball that way. I get it, I have to be out there where, where uh, uh, Stu is. So there's three basic ways. Get the leg across him here, and then you'll angle out. Once you get the leg across him, then there should be no problem. Throws the outside shoulder. And if you get the leg across him, then the guy starts to play over in here. Now you can come around, you can come this way. And then the third way is he's really high and you out in here, and he's loose enough where he takes away that. You take him on into here, now I take, them, I, I take them all the way back in here, just, I just pivot and I just come right back out. You've got to work to get in spacing. I want you to play hard defense against each other. The harder defense you play, the better the offense will become. There are only three things a player can do with a basketball once he catches it. He can pass it, shoot it, or dribble it. Proper spacing helps keep all his options open. And the more a defender has to guard against, the easier he is to beat. One of the most important components of offensive play is proper spacing. Proper spacing. We used to call it operational zones. And the reason it's so important is it's, uh, proper spacing gives you the proper angles of pass, it gives you the proper distances, and it disperses the uh, defense in such a way that uh, you unmass it, you open up the presumably the basket area or the area around the ball. Because we're going to show the players practicing one-on-one -on -one skills first, in these drills they'll concentrate on shooting and using their dribble effectively.
The moves we're about to learn work from either wing or from the high post. But when we discuss them the first time, we'll talk about them and show them from the wing. It's easier to explain that way. Just keep this in mind as we go through. At the high post, if you use your right foot to pivot, the moves are the same as they are from the right wing. If you use your left foot, they're the same as they are from the left wing. While the big man camp is specifically for forwards and centers, the one-on-one -on -one tactics Peak teaches are just as effective for guards. All players can improve their game by incorporating these moves. The better the man-to-man -man defense you play against, the more likely you are to catch the ball with your back to the basket. So in order to face the basket, Pete teaches three different pivots or turns. How you turn depends on how the defender plays you. You use a pivot called the face-up against a defender who plays loose, or what's sometimes called soft defense. When he plays that way, it's usually to stop you from using your dribble to drive to the basket, or to clog the passing lanes. So when the players turn, they look at the basket right away. That gives them the opportunity to size up the defense as they turn. Remember, I keep telling you how important it is when you get that ball to look at the hoop. So many times, you pass up easy shots. And by the time you look at the hoop, the defensive man is adjusted. It's the most primary and important thing you can do when you get the ball. If a defender can play loose and get away with it, he's got a big advantage. So offensively, you need to do something that will force him to play tight, because tight play works to your advantage. That's because your objective is to get the defender off balance. You can't really do that as long as he plays loose. So Pete teaches the players to look at the basket as soon as they pivot. Not only does it give them a chance to look around at the rest of the court, it acts as a threat to shoot the jump shot. That forces the defender to make a decision. Does he stay back or does he come up to take away the jumper? Remember, the name of the strategy is read and react. So when you read that the defender is staying back, you react by taking the jumper. And you keep taking the shot until he comes out to take it away. Look at where the players hold the ball, at chest level. There's a reason for it. Now right there, right there is the most important position you can take when you get the ball. Not over here. Now many of you come out of motion offense in college, and the coach wants you to get the ball here. Well, if you get the ball there, you can't dribble the ball. You can shoot it, and you can pass it, but you can't dribble it. If you get it down here, you can dribble it, and sometimes you can throw a, a fair pass, but sure as hell can't shoot it. But here, you can pass it, you can shoot it, and you can dribble it. And if you get in the habit of bringing the ball here, you're gonna cause defensive men to come to you, and when they come to you, you're gonna be ready to beat them either way. There are times, and there are players who can get away with holding the ball low. They are usually great drivers. For them, holding the ball low is a threat to go strong to the hoop. But unless you can consistently make good on this threat, we suggest that you hold the ball at chest level, as Pete teaches. As we go through this tape, you'll come to understand that offense played best is offense played low. So look at the player's posture. Knees are flexed, balance is low. Whatever the next move is, he can do it quickly from this position. Now we use the inside foot as a pivot foot. Now why? Well, we have uh, four good reasons for it. One is, when he catches a ball, he's got to protect it. And, uh, Two, if I'm playing too tight, he can reverse me and he can take me to the hoop. Now, he's shooting from this area right here. And maybe from here, he shoots the ball 50% of the time. He's a 50% shooter from here. 
Now, if he uses the other foot as a pivot foot, now he goes right to a 40%. And we all know that you don't win many games shooting 40%. Today, you got to shoot around 50. Now, if the defense can force you that far out, the defense has done a good job. And you really can help them if you don't know your feet. So you work hard to get your inside foot. Now, uh, the last thing is, if a guard, uh, Sue hit him and come around, See, he can, give him, he can give him a good screen. He can give him a good screen as he give him the handoff. When you're on the left side of the court, pivot with your left foot. On the right side of the court, pivot with your right. Remember, whenever a defender tries to take something away, he becomes vulnerable to something else. When he comes up to guard against your jump shot, he commits his weight toward you. Now you can use your dribble to beat him to the hoop. Notice that Pete teaches the players not to put the ball on the floor right away. They don't dribble, then try to gain an advantage. They gain an advantage, then exploit it with either their dribble or their jump shot. As we've seen, by facing the basket, the offensive player creates as much uncertainty as he can about what he's going to do next. He tries to make the defender guard against all three possibilities, that he might pass the ball, shoot it, or dribble it. But there is another very important skill that can help him to keep the defender off balance and from predicting his next move. That's the ability to go either to his right or to his left. Pete teaches that it's just as important for a player to develop his non-dominant foot as it is to develop his non-dominant hand. As coaches, we talk about shooting with the right hand, shooting with the left hand. We talk about dribbling with the ball with the right hand, dribbling with the left. I mean, I don't know how many of them ever talked about the feet. You're right footed and you're left footed. And so many players inhibit themselves or they reduce themselves or the effectiveness of their game because they don't develop their left foot. But when you've developed your left foot, you'll take a longer step, you'll be able to come to a better stop, you'll be able to play defensively better because you'll stride better. The player can either go toward the middle or toward the baseline from either wing. From the high post, he can pivot with either foot and go either direction. Pete teaches the players to dribble with their left hand when they go left, with their right hand when they go right. After you've faced up and driven to the basket, the defender will start dropping back to cut off your path to the hoop as you begin to dribble. When you read that, you have some options you can counter with. The first is called the step back move. It works very well against a taller opponent and an effective shot blocker. There are several keys to making this move successful. The first is starting with the same stride as you did when you drove all the way to the basket. That helps to convince the defender that you're driving. There you are. Now, if you drive him back with that first step, 
you're going to end up right in here. If you go lateral with the first step, you're going to end up too far. And don't forget, your, your last step is out to the side so you get the balance. Don't come back in here where you're in your heels. The footwork for the step back is a little different, depending on whether you're going toward the baseline or over the middle. When you go to the baseline from either side, use an odd number of strides plus the step back. Pete teaches it as either a two-step or a four-step move. Yeah. Let's analyze it. From the left side, you pivot with your left foot, so your first stride has to be with your right. If you've made a good first stride and driven the defender back, you can then step back with your left foot. As often as not, however, you'll need more strides. Besides, it will put you closer to the basket. You'll go right, left, right, step back. When you go right from the right side, the same thing is true. Your right foot is your pivot foot, so you stride first with your left. So it will either be left, step back, or left, right, left, step back. Pete teaches the step back to the middle as a three-step move. Stride, stride, step back. From the left side, since your left foot is the one you pivot with, take the first stride with your right. Take one more stride, then step back. From the right side, you stride first with your left, then your right, then step back. So keep in mind that your first step is toward the basket, your last step is to the side. Well executed, the step back move is very difficult to defend against. Most often, the defender will try to stop you by lunging at you. And that sets up your next counter move, the step back continuation. The key to executing the step back continuation is convincing the defender that you are going to take the jump shot off the step back. What helps to sell it more than anything else is a head fake. So do the same footwork, but instead of picking up your dribble and taking the jumper, give a good head fake by looking at the basket and then drive to the hoop. Up to now, we've seen how the players have used their dribble as a threat to drive. But Pete teaches them another counter to use against a defender who plays to stop them from going to the basket. After they've faced up, they use their dribble to go to an open area, either toward the baseline or over the top. That way, they've moved closer to the basket for a higher percentage jump shot. When we get to two-on-two two play, you'll see how this tactic can serve as a counter to a defender who stays back to take away a pass into the low post, or who stays back to break up a pass on the pick and roll. To the jumper going right or left, you can add a pump fake. There are two objectives. The pump fake helps to keep the defender off balance. If he's running at you and he takes the fake, it can lead to a foul. The pump fake makes it hard for him to time his leap to try to block your shot. The other thing it can do is to help you regain your balance. 
I want you all to watch the feet of the shooter. When he comes to a stop and he pump fakes, how he reestablishes his weight. And that shows you how important it is to have good balance when you're shooting. So many times when you're having trouble with your, with your lift because your feet are too close or they're too wide, just practice a pump fake because you unconsciously you're giving yourself balance. Uh, on your pump fake, you don't have to go all the way up. Just enough to get you up. That's all. But you keep these, these knees flexed. If you go way up in here, AC goes way up, but I got to bring it down, and he comes down, and I get nothing out of my pump. So it's just this. Maybe six inches at most. From the face-up, there is basically one more move that Pete teaches as part of his one-on-one -on -one tactics. That move is called the explosion step. It's one-on-one -on -one because it's just one offensive man against one defensive man. But it requires that the defender be aware of a possible screen by another offensive player in a two-on-two -two situation. To use a screen, the offensive player first fakes away, then goes toward it. To use the explosion move, he surprises the defender by continuing to go away from the screen. Pete teaches the players to lean forward, then explode toward the basket as soon as their front foot hits down. That's the series of moves you can make from the face-up. It's very important to master the technique of facing the basket. It serves as the foundation for the whole sequence of moves. Remember, from the wing, use your inside foot to pivot. Look at the basket as soon as you turn. Keep the ball chest high. Keep your knees flexed. Make your opponent guard against all three of the things that you can do with the ball. Shoot, dribble, or pass. Remember, you face up against a defender who plays loose to take away your drive. The threat of the jump shot from the face up makes this sequence of moves effective. To get an advantage, you have to get him off balance. By threatening to shoot the jumper, you get him to commit his weight toward you. Now you have several ways to get a high percentage shot. But the defender may also play tight and overplay you to the middle of the court. That takes away your ability to face up. You can counter with a tactic called the reverse turn. 
What makes the reverse turn effective is the threat of the drive. One of the most important moves you'll learn at this camp, I think, as far as the NBA is concerned, is the reverse driving your man. Just drive me off for the reverse. Driving me off. Because the guys get on you, you've got to have counters. Basketball is a game of counters, offensively. Just as they did with the face-up, the players pivot with their inside foot. But instead of turning toward the center of the court, they turn away to the outside. Notice how important posture is. They have to stay low in order to make this move effective. Staying low accomplishes more than one thing. First, it keeps the ball further away from the defender when the offensive player catches it. It also gives him room to make the turn. If he plays standing straight up, the defender can take away his ability to make any kind of turn. Staying low also makes his movement quicker. Making a definite, strong step toward the basket is how he takes advantage of the overplay to the middle. If the defender doesn't drop back to stop the drive, the offensive man takes the ball to the basket. Notice how and when Pete teaches the players to put the ball on the floor. They don't begin to dribble until they've already made their first stride toward the basket. When they dribble, they push the ball out in front of them. That makes it impossible for the defender to reach around from behind and slap the ball away. And makes it possible for them to reach the basket with the least amount of dribbling from the wing. There's a name for the initial move you make to the basket with the reverse turn. It's called the deep step. You can use it to beat your man. But before long, he's going to react to that movement. You can use the deep step to drive him back, then come back and shoot an open jump shot. Good, good, good. You set it up with your foot, that, uh, your footwork. As long as the defender continues to drop off, you can shoot the jumper. But when he starts coming back to take away your jump shot after you've pushed him off, he's vulnerable to your dribble again. Now you can counter with a move called the rocker step. Good, good, Sam. Good, Sam. Now, Sam. You did a re really good thing that time. You took that step right here, and you used a rod. You realize you used a rocker step on that because you were low, and you get that enough, just enough to get by him. You can do things when you're low. The rocker step is an upper body move. After making the deep step, you don't transfer your weight back to your pivot foot. After you've done the deep step, come back and shot the jumper a couple of times, an upper body fake is enough to pull the defender toward you so that you can go by. Remember, keep your knees flexed and look at the basket. Not transferring your weight back makes the rocker step a quicker, more effective move.
Notice when the players have done the reverse turn, the deep step, and come back, they're in the basic facing the basket position. They're looking at the hoop, ball held at chest level, knees flexed, poised for a jump shot or a pump fake. Because they've gotten the defender off balance, they can do all the same moves they could do from the face-up. There are some things we need to stress as we watch the players go through these moves. In order to have rhythm and balance when you put all the elements together, you have to practice. Adding a deep step, then coming back to the face-up position can complicate the sequence more than you might imagine at first. But when you think about making a reverse turn, deep step, come back, pump fake, go to your left, step back continuation lay-in, you realize that's a lot to master. But if you're willing to work at it, before long you'll be able to do it easily. The other thing to understand is the importance of making these moves continuous. You've gotten the defender off balance with your fakes. If you stop before you make your next move, you give the defender a chance to recover. That negates the advantage you gained by making the fake in the first place. These moves from the reverse turn are just as effective from the high post as they are from the wing. Remember, from the high post, you can pivot with either foot, depending on what gives you the greatest advantage. Pete teaches one more way to pivot in order to face the basket. You use a reverse turn face up against a defender who plays tight and toward the baseline, or tight and straight up. By playing tight, he can take away your ability to do a face up. By playing straight up or overplaying baseline, he can take away the effectiveness of a deep step. As always, in order to make this turn effective, you need to stay low. Because you're getting a tight play, you need to make sure you have room to pivot, just as you did with the reverse turn. But you also need to reach the face-up position. So, in addition to staying low, you need to swing the ball aggressively. That gives you the momentum to complete the turn and it makes it almost impossible for the defender to slap the ball out of your hands without fouling you as you turn. A tight overplay to the baseline is, in effect, 
a challenge by the defender for you to drive to the basket by going over the middle. This turn gives you the momentum to beat him to the hoop. Against honest play, it can also freeze the defender, particularly if you look at the basket as you turn. That can give you all the advantage you need to beat him to the basket. Because you're getting a tight play, you can easily get him to commit his weight. Because this is a tight play, it's easy to beat him when he commits his weight in any direction. In a sense, the reverse turn face-up has the advantages of both the reverse turn and the face-up. Because you're getting a tight play, the defender is vulnerable to the dribble and the drive. Because you're facing the basket after you turn, you're a threat to shoot a jump shot. Whatever he tries to take away makes him vulnerable to something else. Now that we've seen all the turns and all the moves, let's take a few minutes to analyze some of the one-on-one -on -one plays Pete rated as four-star. We want to see just how the players did at reading and reacting and at executing the moves they've learned at camp. Notice how when Kurt Rambus comes out, he's able to get position against Allah Abdulnabi. By getting his leg across Allah's body, he gets to the spot where he wants to catch the ball, straight across from the foul line, about 20 feet from the basket. Kurt uses his inside foot to pivot and faces up, looking at the basket as he turns, keeping his knees flexed. He's ready to drive or shoot a jumper. Respecting Kurt's ability to drive, Ala plays off. So Kurt takes the jump shot. Good there, good. Good. Go again, Timmy. That was a good one. Notice first how Tim Perry uses a different way to get open against Randolph Keyes. He looks up as if he's expecting a lob pass. That brings Randolph back toward him. Now Tim can beat him out to the wing. By trying to deny Tim the ball, Randolph overplays to the middle. That makes him vulnerable to the drive off the reverse turn. Notice how Tim's first step is toward the basket. And to make sure that Randolph can't block his shot, he goes under the basket for a reverse dunk. All in all, this is an excellent read by Tim Perry. This time, Randolph protects against the drive by playing loose. Because in this case it's easier, Tim uses a reverse turn to get to the face-up position. By staying low as he turns and looking at the basket right away, Tim threatens to shoot a jump shot. When he pump fakes, Randolph lunges at him. Tim goes by over the top. By taking a direct route, Tim gets to the basket with one dribble for a left-handed dunk. When Chris Morris comes out to get the ball on the wing, notice how he gets his leg across Danny Manning. Now he can make a good right angle cut and catch the ball in the operational zone. He's in range to shoot a jump shot. He's close enough to reach the basket with one dribble, and if there were other players on the floor, he'd have a good passing angle. Notice that Danny plays Chris straight up and tight. When he reads that, Chris does a reverse turn face-up. By using his inside foot, he doesn't lose ground after he catches the ball. Respecting Chris's ability to drive, Danny drops back. That gives Chris room to shoot the open jumper, and he takes it. Oh, good step back, good step back, beautiful. 
Ala Abdel Nabi comes out and gets the ball in great position in the operational zone on the wing. Notice that Danny Ferry is playing honest, tight and straight behind Ala. So when Ala does a reverse turn and tries to go to the basket for a lay-in, Danny is able to cut him off. Ala wisely decides to take three strides, right, left, right, pick up his dribble on his last stride, then step away from Danny with his left foot. That gives him room to shoot the jumper. Because his step is to the side rather than back, he's balanced and able to go straight up and come straight down. This is perfect execution of the step back move. Once again, notice how Chris Morris gets the ball in the operational zone. When he catches it, it looks as though Danny Ferry is going to overplay him to the middle. So Chris does a reverse turn and a deep step. Meantime, Danny slides over and is playing straight up. When Chris comes back to the face-up position, he looks at the basket and pump fakes. That gets Danny off balance and Chris goes toward the baseline. Recognizing that he might not beat Danny to the basket, he acts like he's going to do a step-back jumper. Notice again how the head fake makes Danny commit his weight toward Chris and gives Chris just enough room to get past him for the reverse layup. Perfect. Good. That was fine. That, hey, that was a good sequence. Sean Kemp on defense makes a mistake by letting Armand Gilliam make body contact while Armand has outside position. Armand easily beats him to the wing and gets the ball right at the free throw line extended about 20 feet from the basket. When Sean gets to the wing, he overplays Armand to the baseline. Notice how Sean has his left foot extended. That means Armand can attack not only his overplay, but also his defensive stance by going to the middle. Armand does a reverse turn face up, but instead of pausing to look up at the basket and pump fake, he just keeps going aware that he has beaten Sean before he even puts the ball on the floor. Okay, that's good, Randolph. Uh, that's what I call the NBA shot right there. The same moves that work from the wing will also work at the low post. Realize that you aren't working with nearly as much room, or in most cases with nearly as much time. Whatever you do, you will probably have to do quickly. On the wing, you always want to use your inside foot to pivot. But on the post, high or low, Pete teaches the players to keep their options open. The best of all worlds for a center when he gets the ball thrown to me is he comes here with a, with a jump stop. Now, a jump stop means simply that you can use either foot as a pivot foot. So if he's over here, I can use that as a pivot foot. If he's over here, I can use that. Now, if you come with a stride stop, you establish your pivot foot, you make it a lot easier for the defense. We saw the effort it takes to get open on the wing. The defender isn't going to let you walk over to the position you want. That's even more true at the post. If you want position, you're going to have to work for it. In general, the better the position you get, the easier your shot is going to be. Ideally, you'll get open along the baseline for an easy layup or dunk. Good, good. There's, there's the uh, proving the lane right there. But chances are that's exactly what the defender is going to try to take away. He's not likely to get any help if you beat him baseline. Odds are, he's going to overplay you that way. So you have to have some ways to score and some counters to use when he takes away certain moves. Just as you had to do on the wing and high post, you have to read what the defensive man is giving you. If you get an overplay to the middle 
or you've established good enough position inside, your first choice is to go strong to the hoop. That move is simply called the power move. That's it. In camp, the players work hard on their power move from the left side. As always, it's important to stay low. That creates enough space for them to operate in. Pete teaches the players to go straight to the basket without dribbling if they can. Or to use a technique called a crab dribble. Ideally, the players should put the ball on the floor with two hands and catch it with two hands. By staying low, the crab dribble helps them explode to the basket. By using both hands, it helps them establish a good base with their feet apart. But you won't always get position that good. If the defender takes away your power move, you can counter with a hook shot going toward the baseline. Now, again, let me, let me explain. Your foot has to be pointed there to get your hip into it. If your foot is like this, you're not going to get your hip into your hook. So that foot there is going to key. So when you take it, you've unlocked your uh, hip. From the low post, the hook shot is really a potent weapon. Another counter for a defender who overplays to the middle but takes away the power move is the step back jumper. It's the same move as the step back from the wing, only it's quicker. Pete teaches the players to take one quick dribble one quick stride, step back, and shoot. He also teaches them a simple rule for determining which foot to use as their pivot. Remember where that defensive man is. Whatever side he's on, that's your pivot foot. The other one you kick back. So if the defender is on your right side, pivot with your right foot. If he's on your left side, Pivot with your left. At the low post, when a good defender overplays to the baseline, he takes away your direct path to the basket. So you counter by going to the middle and taking a shot. One option is the hook shot. And remember that the footwork on this move is just as important as it was going baseline. Anytime you're stepping off right or left for a hook shot, your toes should be pointed the opposite sideline. If you shoot this way, you're going to lock your hip. You're not going to have a follow through. But if you shoot, the, if you, you take that step there, as you come up in here, you'll get the follow through, you'll get your hip. The players also learn that what they do with their inside arm is just as important to a hook shot as their footwork and shooting hand. When I take the hook and I come in here, keep this hand up. Don't push him off, but keep it up. Because then when you extend the ball, they can't get at you. If you drop your hand here, he can get at that ball easy. But if you keep your hand, as you go up, you keep your arm up this way, you, you, you deter him from being able to get easy at that ball. And not only that, if you keep your left hand on the ball, you can, you can uh, finger and wrist it easier. If you drop your left hand, you start to give it the palm and the stiff arm.
Another way to counter the baseline overplay is the step back to the middle. Keep in mind that it's important to drive the defender off with one dribble, a quick stride, then a step back. Remember, these moves have to be precise at the post because you don't have as much space or time as you had from the wing. Notice that the first stride on both the hook shot and the step back to the middle are the same. When the defender counters by coming out to take away your hook shot or step back, he becomes vulnerable to the drop step power move. Good, that's it. Good, good pivot. Good pivot. One of the people who helps Pete run the camp, Stu Lance, explains. If you've got the ball in the low post and you're able to step across the key, you know you have your hook shot available to you. If he makes you step and your foot is pointed toward the triangle of the free throw line and the, uh, the lane itself, you step this way, he's taking the hook away, but that leaves you your drop. I mean, it's a quick read. As soon as you step this way, you know you're, you cannot unlock the hip, so you drop step back here and you have your power move to the basket. It's a very quick read. If you can step across the key, your foot goes this way, it'll unlock your hip, you'll rotate for your hook. If he makes you step this way, you're not going to be able to unlock the hip, you know you've got to drop step. He can't take both away from you. Make him do it from a middle post, Stu. Okay. Players learn one more counter to use at the low post. When a defender takes away the baseline hook shot or step back, he becomes vulnerable to the drop step power move coming back to the middle. One more time, Elvin. When you do your drop step, you must make sure he's taking your hook. You don't allow him to take your drop as well. If you come here and then drop step to the middle this way, he's going to get back at you. When you drop, Watch how the players stay low. Many of them use the crab dribble to help them explode to the basket. These are the fundamentals of low post play Pete teaches at camp. Always come to a jump stop. Whatever side the defender is on, use that foot to pivot. Stay low. Dribble as little as possible. Using a crab dribble helps you establish a good base and explode to the basket. When the defender takes away your direct path to the basket, use a hook shot or a step back jumper. If he forces you to take your first step away from the basket, use your drop step power move. Now when you read how a defender is playing you on the low post, you have enough moves in your arsenal to get a good high percentage shot at close range. At camp, the players work on even more ways to get an advantage over the defense. By playing two-on-two two or three-on-three, 
they can use some other techniques, namely passing and screening. They have many more situations to exploit with the read and react strategy. Let's look at some of the possibilities when one man goes out to the high post, the other to the wing. If the wing defender overplays to the middle, trying to deny his man the ball, he becomes vulnerable to the back door play. It's that overplay that the wing and high post need to read. But besides reading the defense, communication, timing, and execution of the bounce pass are critical to the success of this play. One way or another, the forward and center have to let each other know that they've seen the overplay. When the guard who's handling the ball picks up his dribble, both players break for their positions. That way, they'll have good timing on the play. Then, to make sure the play works, Pete has the high post throw a bounce pass. Let me explain something of uh, why you use a bounce pass. There are many reasons you use a bounce pass. Now, one reason is, I got a big man on me here. Get a, say he's, he's over here. I got a big man. He doesn't play the game low. Now, he's got his arm out in here, and you throw this pass, it may, it may be a uh, block. I'm throwing this ball. You're coming back together. I'm throwing this ball by this man's body. He may not see that thing until it's right up there, and I'm throwing the ball right where his hand is. Now, now this... This is the most important thing of all. The retreating defense, a man plays high and he doesn't play low. And that bounce pass goes under, because he's not down there, he's up here high. This man's high, he's high. And also that bounce pass you can see. Remember also, in order to make a good bounce pass, you have to stay low. If you stand straight up, that's how the ball will bounce, straight up. When the defense good. takes away good, the back good, door, good. there are a couple of ways the offense can counter. The high post defender may drop back and clog the passing lane, or the wing defender may get good position. The high post can then fake the back door pass, come back, and shoot the jumper. Regardless of whether the post is high or low, all right, all right. the players learn to go all the way through whenever they cut toward the basket from the wing. It may mean getting an open shot close to the basket. Or at least it will clear enough space for the post player to go one-on-one -on -one against his defender. The players also work on certain techniques for getting the ball to the low post from the wing. What position the low post defender gets dictates what kind of pass the wing throws. When the defender plays directly behind, Pete teaches a direct pass. Right there is the easiest pass in the world. The easiest pass in the world, you, don't, you know, you've got to set it up. But say you have your right hand up there. I just fake his right hand down and then I just give him, I just give him a crew cut. But the situation is different when the low post gets position on the defender either to the baseline or to the middle. First he needs to be sure he can hold that position. He does that with a technique called hooking and pinning. See here's the position you had about like this. I want, to, I want you in here. Really hook him in here. See if you're this way he can slide around you here the only way you can go is this way, and then you just take him with you. If he tries to go this way, then you got him for an easy. So don't be afraid of, of uh, post play is so much legs. That's it. That's it. When the low post has position to the baseline, in order to create a passing lane, the wing has to dribble to the baseline, then throw the pass. Now I read he's got a seal, you got a seal. I read that seal. So I take a dribble in here and then I improve the lane right to there because I got a good angle. But I can't do that till I see the seal. When you, once you show me you got that man hooked, then I take the dribble. The guy's down here, then I can give you that pop. But look for the bounce on that. That's called improving the lane. 
When the players need to improve the lane against a baseline overplay, they use the same technique to the middle. When the post defender fronts or overplays so much that he can deny the pass from the wing, then he can't take away the pass from the top of the key. To get good position, the low post needs to pivot, hook the defender with his legs, and pin him on his back. When the weak side forward reads this, he slides over to the top of the key. Now, instead of passing the ball to the low post, the wing can pass to the weak side forward, who has a much easier pass to the post. Hooking and pinning the defender is also an important component of setting screens. And setting screens is a very important component of big man offensive play. There are a number of different kinds of screens. You can screen on the ball, away from the ball, or in a sense, set a screen when you have the ball. Let's start with screening on the ball. One player goes out to the wing, the other comes out and sets a screen for him. Now, on setting that screen, straddle the leg and then keep yourself, you know, really keep yourself low. The guy with the ball always fakes away from the screen. And the reason he does that, because he gives, say, all right, he's on this side. He's faking away. By doing that, he allows the screen to set tighter and legally. If he fakes toward the screen, you're gonna get an offensive foul, and chances are you're not gonna get a very good screen. As is true of almost all components of offensive play, the key to setting a good screen is staying low. A good screen forces the defenders to make a decision. Do they switch or try to play through the screen? When they don't switch, it usually means the man with the ball will get an advantage over his man, who's been picked. When they do switch, the man with the ball may still get a step on the defender who's covering him. Good! That was it! All right, there's the explosion. In effect, the explosion step is a fake use of the screen. The screener actually comes up to set it, but the man with the ball goes away from it. Just as the man with the ball can fake using the screen, the screener can fake setting it and break toward the basket. This is called slipping the pick. It greatly complicates the decisions defenders have to make about which man to cover. Not only does it take advantage of the confusion that a switch situation creates, it also helps keep the defense honest. Now they have to guard against the screen and be ready for the fake screen as well. There is another screening tactic to help the offense get an edge on the defense. It's probably the most basic of all basketball plays. It's called the pick and roll. 
and it's a very potent weapon when it's properly executed. Making it work requires communication between the two players and correct reading of the defense. After setting the pick, the screener winds up with the ball. In order for this to work, he has to pin the defender behind him. The better the screen you put on, the better chance you have of getting a good shot. If I put this kind of a screen on him, I'm going to let him go right over the top. There's no switch. Neither one of us getting a thing. But if I come on in here and I get down low and I put this screen here on him, and go on, Armin, and I put that screen, I make him switch. Either that or Armin's got a good shot. And then when I come, this is my footwork here. I get, uh, I get Steve behind me. He's trying to get over in here. Say, Steve, you're trying to say go over this way. I take him right with me. Now you're ready to pass. Now I got him behind me. You got to stay low. You cannot make a pivot. You can't make a pivot standing like this. You just can't. You can try, but it ain't going to work. You got to be down here. You got to use your butt and get it down there where it can do some good. These are the possibilities in a two on two situation when the offense can screen on the ball. The man with the ball can use the screen and take a shot. Or he can fake using the screen, go away from it, and explode to the basket. The screener can slip the pick and go to the basket. Or he can set the pick, then roll, keeping the defender behind him. Now let's look at what can happen when you screen away from the ball. First, the screen defender tries to go over the top of the pick to get out to the wing. But instead of going to the wing, the offensive man fades to the baseline. He's open, and he's got the defender chasing him. He may have an open jumper and take it, or he may drive baseline toward the hoop. That forces the post defender to make a decision. Does he step out to stop the drive or stay with his man? If he comes out, that leaves his man open. If he stays back, the other player has the shot. If the defender gets trapped in the middle by the screen, the wing can also come out and circle back down the lane. Once again, it forces the post defender to make a decision. Does he step out and try to stop the drive or stay back? When there's a screen away from the ball, sometimes both defenders will chase one man to the wing or to the corner. That leaves the other offensive player wide open down low. Though it may seem like a strange idea, you can also screen when you have the ball. The defense can counter this when the player who's guarding the man with the ball steps out to stop the man who cuts through. But that makes the defense vulnerable to the fake. Instead of giving the ball to the man cutting, the man with the ball does a reverse turn face up and goes to the hoop. He's already pinned the screen defender on his back. These plays show us how two or three players can work together to get an advantage over the defense. You can see how discipline creates high percentage opportunities. And you can see how important it is to learn how to read the defense and react to it. When you do, you can take advantage of whatever the defense gives up. There's no way for them to take away everything you can do. You have to read what they are trying to stop and do what they're vulnerable to. Let's take a closer look at how the players put it all together in two-on-two -two and three-on-three -three situations. We'll analyze some more of the plays Pete gave four stars to. Notice how Armand Gilliam comes out to the wing to get the ball. Because he's on the left side of the floor, he establishes his left foot as his pivot foot, keeping the ball at chest level as he turns against A.C. Green. Now, as Benoit Benjamin comes up to set the pick, Gary Leonard steps out to help defend against Armand if he uses the pick. Armand realizes he won't gain any advantage by going to his right, so he fakes as though he's going to use the pick and goes toward the baseline. 
AC Green is in good position to stop him from driving, but by going toward the baseline, Armand has improved his passing lane. Because Gary Leonard stepped out to the middle, anticipating a switch, Benoit now easily beats him to the basket. Benoit takes an excellent angle to the hoop, and Armand makes an excellent bounce pass. It's a sort of variation on the classic pick and roll, but it's a good read by Armand, good reaction by Benoit. Watch how Brian Quinette comes out to the spot where he's a threat to pass, shoot, or drive. Just as Armand did, Brian uses his inside foot as his pivot and faces up. Notice how he fakes away from the screen set by Stuart Gray before going to the middle. The screen forces the defenders to switch. Brian realizes that William Bedford, who's playing back, has taken away his drive so he picks up his dribble and looks at the basket. When Brian pump fakes, he reestablishes his balance and sees that he has an open jumper, so he takes it. Remember in one-on-one, -on -one, we learned to either go baseline or over the middle after facing the basket, pump fake, and shoot. This is the same move used in a two-on-two -two situation. By overplaying Ala Abdelnabi to the middle, Elton Campbell is able to deny him the ball on the wing. So it goes into Kevin Duckworth at the post. When Elton goes over to help Doug Roth guard Kevin, Ala goes back door and Kevin fakes giving him the ball. Both defenders realize that Ala is headed for the basket by himself. Doug Roth steps out to cover him and Elton chases him. That leaves Kevin all alone for a wide open jump shot. On this play, Chris Morris, the forward, exchanges positions with Milos Babich, the center. That's because Chris notices that Danny Ferry is overplaying to the middle to deny him the ball on the wing so he goes to the high post. Danny Ferry plays excellent defense. He recognizes the exchange immediately, switches, and still denies the ball to Milos. Not only that, but he gets good enough position to take away the back door. When Chris Morris recognizes that, he fakes a pass to the wing, looks at the basket, and pump fakes. That gets Chris Dudley to commit his weight toward him, just enough for him to go by. In spite of the fact that all three defenders collapse on him, Chris puts the ball up and in with his left hand. This is an excellent example of reading and reacting, and a great display of athletic ability. Because Ala Abdelnabi has been really overplaying Gerard Mustaf to the middle, the offense knows he's vulnerable to the backdoor play. Notice how Gerard and Steve Johnson break for their positions at about the same time. Because Allah's weight is back, he can't react quickly enough to stay up with Gerard when Gerard cuts to the hoop. Watch how Steve Johnson stays low and throws a bounce pass that gets by Kevin Duckworth and is the perfect height for Gerard to catch. There you have it. Those are the fundamentals of big man play as Pete Newell teaches them. We've learned the read and react strategy and the tactics it takes to make that strategy effective. We've seen the players put them to work in one-on-one, two-on-two, -one, two -on -two, and three-on-three -three situations. There's a lot here to absorb and synthesize, but it's worth the effort. The payoff is not only a game that's fundamentally sound, but also a strategy for taking advantage of any man-to-man -man defense that's played against you. Now you have a whole system of counters to use.
There's one more thing. While the players are in camp, besides getting their games in shape, they work on making sure that their bodies are in shape for the upcoming season. Games are won and lost many times by that little extra effort. Games are won and lost usually in the last five minutes of the half, last five minutes of a game. And many times they're lost because the player has never learned to reach down. He, uh, he doesn't fill a lane when it could mean the, uh, the basket puts you ahead. Uh, he doesn't get back on transition because he's tired and he's going to hope somebody else picks up his man. If you have to practice, you have to practice reaching down. So in these drills, when you're really tired, just practice reaching down. Every day, the last thing the players do is work with conditioning expert Mark Grabo. In addition to working out aerobically, Pete makes sure the players have an opportunity to work on improving their strength. After practice, several of the players headed for Gold's gym. After all, in the battle for position at the low post and under the boards, strength is as important as finesse. We really had a good week, and, and uh, really appreciate all the support good and all week, the help you gave. One, two, Real three, good. go! And good luck next year, all of you. And remember what you did, why you did it. Thanks a lot. Okay, AC, real glad to have you. Thank you. Well, Steve, good luck to you now. When all is said and done, and camp breaks up on Friday, one thing is clear. All the people who participated in camp leave here feeling a great deal of affection and admiration for Pete Newell one of the great teachers the game of basketball has ever had.